Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all for joining me today. I know I'm in the same shirt as the last two videos. You're just gonna have to deal with it. I recorded three videos in one night and then I'm not changing shirts. <laughs> so with that being said, today we're gonna be taking a look at Jeremy Grantham's recent sort of memo. It's not really a memo. It's more of just kind of a, a blog post almost that he put out. We, we looked at his other video or other letter um, rather here in the video up in the card. You can take a look at it and kind of get an idea because that's kind of what this is all stemming off of is this super bubble idea that he's been talking about both in that letter and in the interviews that he's done. Um, the Value Investor Podcast, no, it's not um, the Investors Podcast, TIP, I think is what they did. Uh, they did an interview with him recently and he kind of talked over this, but I'm just going to go through this with you. If you want to take, you know, put your headphones on, just listen. Uh, we're just going to go over his little blog post and give, I'm going to give you some just insight of what I have at least or whatever it's worth. Um, just give you guys some pointers and things. If you're just reading these kinds of things for the first time, that's kind of the whole goal of this. But with that being said, I'll share my screen. If you're listening to this and you have your phone on the other side of the room, go ahead, throw some headphones on, but let's dive right into this. So taking a look at this, you're going to be able to see it's on this like research library that he has. It's really just a blog post, uh, but it's by Jeremy Grantham himself. And we're just going to kind of read through it and give some pointers. And then we'll kind of have it a conclusionary period at the end. But the executive summary said only a few market events in the investor's career really matter. And the, among the most important of all super bubbles, these super bubbles are events unlike any others. While there are only a few in history for investors to study, they have clear futures in common. One of those feature features is the bear market rally after the initial derating stage of decline, but before the economy has clearly begun to deteriorate as it always has when super bubbles burst. This is in all three previous cases recovered over the half the market's initial losses, luring unaware investors back just in time for the market to turn down again, only more viciously in the economy to weaken this summer's rally has so far perfectly fit the pattern. The U.S. stock market remains very expensive and an increase in inflation like the one this year has always hurt multiples, although more slowly than this than normal this time. But now the fundamentals have also started to deteriorate enormously and surprisingly between COVID and China, war in Europe, food and energy crises, record fiscal tightening and more. The outlook is far grimmer than could have been foreseen in January. Longer term, a broad and permanent food and resource shortage is threatening, all made worse by accelerating climate damage. The current Super Bowl features an unprecedentedly dangerous mix of cross-asset overvaluations with bonds, housing, and stocks all critically overpriced and now rapidly losing momentum, commodity shock, and Fed hawkishness. Each cycle is different and unique, but every historical parallel suggests that the worst is yet to come. This is sort of, you know, history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. Uh, <laughs> it's basically what he's pointing out here. Now, he said, the time that really matters for investors. Most of the time, 85% of the time, markets behave quite normally. In these periods, investors are happy enough, but alas, these periods do not truly matter. It's only the fi other 15% of the time that matters when investors get carried away and become irrational. Mostly, this irrationality is excessive optimism when you see meme stock squeezes and IPO frenzies, such as in the last two years, just now and then. Investors panic and sell regardless of the value as they did at six, 666 on the S&P 500 in 2009. With many stocks trading at 2.5 PE in 1974, these times of euphoria and panic are most important for portfolios, the most dangerous for careers. So he gives a sort of example from Keynes' um, famous chapter 12. And he said it suggests that when confronted with a bubble, running off the cliff with a company is the safest strategy for managers whose business imperative, after all, is to be a permable. Where real money can be made, this is a strategy adopted reasonably enough by almost everyone. This 15% is very different from ordinary bull and bear markets. Averaging ordinary bull and bear markets with a handful of outliers dilutes the data and produces misleading signals. My strong suggestion is to treat the two bubbles, two and a half to three sigma events, as special collectively unique occasions. It is as if the... There is a phase change in the investor behavior after a long economic upswing in a long bull market when the financial and economic systems look nearly perfect, especially with low inflation and high profit margins, as it is the friendliness of the authorities, especially towards cheap leverage, and there gets to be a flashpoint, like that summer evening where every last flying ant takes off simultaneously. This effect luckily creates measurable events in the markets so you can see explosion of confidence and speculation and crazy wishful thinking, regardless of value however you wish to define it. And outcomes that from this unique group of super bubbles are indeed special. The most discussed divergence between conservative and speculative stocks, the rapid bear market rally discussed later here, the rapid onset 
of recession, and finally, the much increased probabilities of further unexpected financial and economic accidents. We've been in such a period, a true super bubble for a little while now, and the first thing you remember here is that these super bubbles, as well as ordinary two sigma bubbles, have always in developed equity markets broken back to trend. The higher they go, therefore, the further they have to fall. So he's talking about, he talked about this in his last letter, and really what he's talking about in this two sigma event is think of, um, you know, you get to sort of like a overvaluation and you might have like a little bit of optimism, over optimism, which might be like a two sigma or one sigma event. But really what ends up happening is you get to two, two and a half, three, and really it's kind of reaching that critical point of, um, you know, getting too out of hand. And that's what he's saying is that super bubble is when you have multiple different asset classes hitting sort of that three sigma, two and a half sigma mark. And that's what happened in bonds, equities, and uh, housing. And he pointed that out in his last letter. Now he said the stages of a Super Bowl, my theory is that the breaking of these Super Bowls takes multiple stages. First, the bubble forms. Second, a setback occurs as if it just did in the first half of this year when some wrinkle in the economic or political environment causes investors to realize that perfection will, after all, not last forever. Valuations take a half step back. Then there is what we have just seen, the bear market rally. Fourth and finally, fundamentals deteriorate and the market declines to a low. Let's return to where we are in the process state. Bear market rallies and super bubbles are easier and faster than any other rallies. Investors surmise this stock sold for $100 six months ago, so now at $50, $60, $70, it must be cheap. Outside of the late stage of a Super Bowl, new highs are slow and nervous as investors realize that no one has ever bought the stock at this price before. So it's four steps forward, three steps back, gingerly exploring terra incognita. Bear market rallies are opposite. It's sold at 100 before, maybe it could sell at 100 again. The proof of the pudding is the speed and scale of these bear market rallies. From the November low in 1929 to April 1930 high, the market rallied 46%, a 55% recovery, percent recovery of the loss from the peak. In 1973, the summer rally after the initial decline recovered 59% of the S&P's 500's total loss from the high. In 2000, the NASDAQ recovered 60% of its initial losses in just two months. In 2022, at the intraday peak on August 16th, the S&P 500 made about 58% of its losses since its June low. Thus, we could say that the current event so far is looking eerily similar to these historic super bubbles. So going back to this sort of section, what he's saying is that people anchor on a price that they're buying at rather than sort of looking rationally and sort of redoing their entire sort of analysis, whether it's on a ETF or, you know, index fund like the S&P 500 or NASDAQ or an actual individual company, they look at a stock price and they say, it's been this high, how could it not go any higher? That's kind of like Coinbase is a great example. It hit $400, I think it's under 100 now. And people just wonder like, why does this happen? Well, people sell off and the smart people leave early and the other people are left holding the bag. It's kind of the idea here. But essentially, when you have, as a value investor, when you have something like this happen, your company falls like this, it's better to relook at a rational basis. And Gary Mishuris actually was on Everything Money's podcast and kind of talked about this, that uh, when he has something like this happen, he redoes his entire research as if he were doing it from scratch to see if he comes up with sort of the similar number that he had originally came up with. So it's it's very, very interesting is very important that you don't get anchored to a certain price it's really about the value of the company the fundamentals start to deteriorate that changes the value of the company now he said fundamentals threaten to fall apart economic data inevitably lags major turning points in the economy to make matters worse at the turn of events like 2000 2007 data series like corporate profits and employment can sub subsequently be massively revised downwards it is during this lag the bear market rally typically occurs why are the historic Super Bowls always followed by major economic setbacks? Perhaps because they have occurred after a very extended buildup of market and economic forces with a major surge of optimism thrown in at the end. At the peak, the economy was always looks perfect, full employment, strong GDP, no inflation, record margins. This was the case in 1929, 1972, 1999, and in Japan. The aging cycle and temporary near perfection of fundamentals leave economic and financial data with only one way to go. Down, obviously. Our explaining PE exhibit says something similar. The first leg down in today's Super Bowl is explained by rising inflation, which has been the main driver of historical valuations after an unprecedented lag during the second half of 2021, although the most speculative stocks were hit fast and hard from the beginning of 2021. If anything, the question for us at GMO is why such a historical inflation surge in 2021 did not have an immediately hit broad market PEs more substantially. New players in the super stock market and familiar with inflation? 
excessive belief in the Fed's ability to support markets and hence too much faith that the inflation would be transitory, the next leg for the model is likely to be driven by falling margins. Our best guess is that the level of explained PE will fall towards 15x compared to the current level explained PE of just 20x. While the actual PE just rose from 30 to 34x in mid-August, it was probably a bear market rally. Of course, if the model is indeed driven by falling margins in the near future, then the E will fall as well as the PE. As you can see, this would imply a substantially lower market than we have suggested. So it kind of gives a graph of what they've done. Really what this is showing is sort of the disconnect that we're seeing, the divergence that you're seeing. Um, it's kind of crazy to see what this played out like and what ended up happening. I mean, just look at this in 2000, like that is crazy. Um, so my paper is waiting for the last dance and let wild rumpus begin made a simple point. In the US, the three near perfect markets with crazy investor behavior, two and a half plus sigma overvaluation have always been followed by big market declines of 50%. The paper said nothing about fundamentals except some deterioration. Now here we are having experienced the first leg down of a bubble bursting and a substantial bear market rally and we find the fundamentals are far worse than expected. The whole world is now fixated on the growth reducing implications of inflation rates and wartime issues such as the energy squeeze. In addition, there are several less obvious short-term problems. Meanwhile, the long-term problems of demographics, resources, and climate are only getting worse and are now beginning to bite even in the short run. So here are some of the near-term problems and longer-term problems that they view um, at GMO. The near-term problems, the food, energy, fertilizer problems exacerbated by the war in Ukraine are even worse in the emerging world than the European energy problems we have heard about. Russia and Belarus account for 40% of global exports of potash, a key fertilizer, driving wheat, corn, soybean prices to records earlier this year. Increased food and energy prices are causing acute trade imbalances and civil disorder in the most vulnerable countries, as seen, for example, an extremely rapid virtual collapse of Sri, Sri Lankan um, economy. The energy shock is now all but guaranteed to tip at Europe into a recession, while the U.S. market has a long history of ignoring foreign problems and interactions Global growth is assuredly coming down. In China, which has carried by far the biggest load of global growth for the last 30 years, too many things are going wrong at the same time. The COVID pandemic continues massively affecting its economy. Simultaneously, the Chinese property complex, key to the Chinese economic growth, is now under dire stress. This real estate weakness is mirrored around the world, with U.S. home building, for example, now declining rapidly to well below average levels, as perhaps it should have been given the record unaffordability of new mortgages. The situation looks even worse in those countries where mortgages are typically floating rate. Historically, real estate has been the most important asset class for, mo for economic stability. We're coming off one of the greatest fis fiscal tightenings in the history as government withdraws COVID stimulus, both in the U.S. and globally. Historically, there have been strong relations between fiscal tightening and some subsequent decline in margins. See appendix. We'll go down to that after. Um, at the same time, the U.S. excise tax on stock buybacks looks to harbinger the U.S. government in beginning to shift its attitude towards the eternal battle between labor and capital. This may even flow through in time to renewed antitrust action, which would be fantastic for consumers, but less fantastic for stock investors. So let me just go down to the appendix real quick, get an idea of the GDP growth. So for the longer term problems are really just to cap off the near term problems. You can see that there's just a ton of near term problems. There's a lot of things that are really going to play into the effect. And I mean, you see someone like Warren Buffett buying Oxy like crazy. He can see, you know, when you take a, a basically a participant out of the entire market and you remove a lot of it, there's a lot of opportunities there because you end up, you know, consolidating a lot more of that market to, you know, the pricing control and everything that happens, especially when you're a key input to everything like fertilizer and your energy or oil. Um, it becomes more and more of an issue and people can charge higher prices because the demand and supply um, becomes imbalanced until the pricing sort of sorts itself out. So longer term problems, population, workers are beginning to be in short supply and will stay that way for the indefinite future in China and developed world where no single country is producing babies at a replacement rate. Together with rapid aging, this will be on a drag on growth and a push on inflation. Resources, many metals, especially those required for decarbonizing, are in unavoidable squeeze, lacking sufficient reserves, which currently are a mere 5 to 20 percent of what is needed. CapEx is woefully low. It is simply does not compute and makes clear that our existence in a faintly satisfactory condition will depend on our sustained success with replacement recycling and new technologies. A second critical resource shortage is fertilizer, potash, and phosphate, both currently mined and both necessary for all life, are A, finite and very unevenly distributed. 
Morocco controls 75% of the world's best phosphate, and Russia and Belarus mine 45% of current potash. With even more than that mined in Canada, food with deteriorated and eroded soil, freshwater shortages, and increasingly resistant pests, food productivity is slowing down even as African population growth outweighs the slowdown elsewhere. The UN Global Food Index was recently at an all-time high. Climate can be seen as this year as in danger of spiraling out of control. Never before have there been major droughts and dangerously high temperatures and fires beset China, India, Europe, and North America at the same time. This is severe enough to act as a drag on global GDP. The Rhine, which moves nearly 20% of German heavy traffic, is closed by drought. French nuclear power stations have to have had to reduce production because rivers are too hot to be used for cooling. China has had to have its hydropower, which has been reduced in Canada, Norway, India, and elsewhere by low water levels. Rising temperatures in India, Asian parts of Africa are suddenly high enough to pose health problems for those without air conditioning and outdoor workers, especially farmers. The collective impact of difficult farming weather is beginning to impose its own global costs and may destabilize a growing number of poorer countries in the near future. It is all happening so much faster than anyone expected 10 years ago. All that is to say, these long-term negative issues that I have kept at the back of my mind for years, climate, human, fertility, food, and other resources, now becoming relevant short-term issues that bear, bear in mind on both inflation and growth. Indeed, collectively, they pose a potential risk to our long-term viability. Again, you know, the long-term issues and the short-term issues are really big um, and Obviously, in a sort of weird kind of way, it can present opportunities um, if you know what you're looking for and you're trying to find companies. And again, I point back to Oxy and how important that was to Warren Buffett. And, you know, he sold off the position. I believe they got shares in 2020 because they um, I think it was convertible notes that they had sold um, Oxy to Berkshire. And then they started buying. The, they sold off those shares and they started buying the company back in 2022 when all the Ukraine and Russian madness happened. Now, as they're pointing, as he's pointing out, uh, GMO's pointing out, or really Jeremy's pointing out, um, the longer term problems of population, climate, as well as some of the other factors that he had talked about here, as far as like commodities and things like that, that's going to continue to be an issue. So. As an investor, you're trying to think about where is this business position, what's the business model, how do they make money, but also you have to think about the macro now and think about especially for things like commodities or things that rely on commodities like industrials and things like that. You have to think about where the opportunity is and what uh, what can actually impact the pricing on those commodities and how that plays into everything else. So that's why like a lot of people, they'll, if they don't like gold necessarily investing into gold, but they like the gold miners because they can, you know, predict the cash flow a little bit better. They can actually, you know, go look at the company and how they make money and things like that. So those may be some opportunities that you see in the near term or maybe even the long term that may come down in price just due to overall market weakness. But, you know, there may actually be opportunities. So it'll be an interesting next couple of years to see what kind of weakness comes out of all of this. Now, for the last paragraphs, he said, prepare for epic finale. Previous Super Bowls saw a much worse subsequent economic outlook if they combined multiple asset classes, housing and stocks, as in Japan in 1989, or globally in 2006, or if they combined an inflation surge and rate shock, the stock bubble, as in 1973 in the US and elsewhere. The current Super Bowl features the most dangerous mix of these factors in modern times. All three major asset classes, housing, stocks, and bonds, were critically historically overvalued at the end of last year. Now we're seeing an inflation surge and rate shock as in the early 1970s as well. And to make matters worse, we have a commodity and energy surge as painfully seen in 1972 and in 2000. These commodity shocks have always cast a long growth suppressing shadow. Given all these negative factors, it is unsurprising that the consumer and business confidence measures are testing historic lows. In the tech sector, the leading edge of the U.S. economy, hiring is slowing, layoffs are rising, and CEOs are increasingly bracing for recession. Recently, we've seen a bear market rally. If has so far played out exactly in line with the three historical precedents, the bear market rallies that mark the middle phase of deflating super bubbles. If the bear market has already ended in the parallels with three other super bubbles, so far strangely in line, would have completely broken. This is always possible. Each cycle is different and each government response is unpredictable, but these few epic events seem to act according to their own very own rules in their own play and which has apparently just been paused between third and final act. If history repeats, the play will only be once again be a tragedy. We must hope this time for a minor one. So again, um, the rest of this is kind of appendix stuff and things that they're using. But what you need to pay attention to as an investor is, you know, 
I know people say, like, if you look at macroeconomics and all, it's not worth your time. But I do think that there is some, you know, you need to know what you're investing in. And so not necessarily looking at macroeconomics as a whole, but maybe looking at in your industry what is actually happening and understanding that. That is kind of the big thing, especially if you're into, into industrials or commodities, um, what is actually happening. So with that being said, I hope you liked the letter. I hope you liked the reading. I'm hoping that I added something to this. Let me know down in the comments below if you want to see more videos like this or less videos like this or what your thoughts were. Um, I'm hoping to do more letters as they kind of come out and as people give their thoughts and uh, be able to you know, insert my own and be able to actually read these with you guys. Because the goal for me is to be able to actually read these and then share it with you in case you don't see these. Um, so with that being said, thank you all for joining me today. Let me know if I miss anything down below if you have any other thoughts on this topic as far as the macro goes. It's always really interesting to read about. But with that being said, have a great day and happy investing.